and Imosi Travisi, my dear Pathfinders, welcome to Bugfinder Quest Killer Infinite Loading Screen Ultimate Guide. Jokes aside, the game is in far better state now than on its release date. So, let's make one thing very clear from the very start of this guide. This is not the guide about specific builds where you follow specific things because someone named the build Dread Knight or whatever while claiming it. How it's fucking OP, for example. This is the ultimate guide where I share my experience with you that will make your life easier on unfair difficulty and that will allow you to play how you'd like and how you want to play. You can be open-minded and play whatever you like. Trust me, everything will work for you by the time we finish this guide. This, this is the hardest guide I ever made for the most complex CRPG in the recent history. As with all of my Ultimate Guides videos, we are going to cover everything there is about this game. Mechanics, tactics, skills, races, classes, choices, entire map, and what you should do in correct order. And of course, Kingdom Management. The game is complex as hell, but once you get to know it, you can start playing it on unfair or hard difficulty and experience some real challenge in a single player game. This game is freaking hard on harder difficulties, so everything I say in this video applies for unfair and hard difficulties. Hence, it will work on easier difficulties too, but it will make the game less fun and very easy if you decide to play on easier difficulties below hard and unfair. So, we're gonna start with simple things. You enter the character creation and you're overwhelmed with all the info and one million different things. So the first question you ask is, what class should I play? What race should I pick? Well, this game will give you Jubilast as Alchemist, Ekundayo as a Ranger, Knock Knock as a Rogue, Harim as a Cleric, Amiri as a Barbarian, Jaital as Inquisitor, Lindsay as a bard, Octavia as a oh, scholar as a mix of wizard, rogue, arcane, trickster, Regongar as eldritch scion, eldritch knight, or better to say this is magus class, Tristian as a classy teorge, or better to say a cleric, and Valerie as a tower shield specialist, or better to say a fighter class. And of course, in the DLC, you'll get two sisters, kineticists, kineticist class, Kalikia and Kanira. So, having that in mind, if you want to experience new classes and get to see all of your companion classes, you might want to consider playing with a monk, a paladin, a monk-paladin mix, sorcerer, wizard, druid, slayer, Monk Rogue mix, Sorcerer Alchemy mix, Rogue Slayer mix, and so on. You notice that this game doesn't have classic classes as companions like Pure Wizard, Pure Sork, Pure Paladin, Pure Druid, which sucks a bit, but that's life. OP classes in the game are Ranger, Alchemist, Sorcerer, and the Cleric. In short, Ranger has huge damage with bows and you'll find amazing amount of good short bows and long bows in the game. You'll also receive great artisan heavy crossbow later on. Alchemist is another crazy class that will provide you with a lot of damage with his bombs. Fire bombs, acid bombs, electric bombs, holy bombs and so on. And of course buffs for your entire party. Alchemist is OP early, when the game is hardest, and a bit weaker towards late game, from level 18 to level 20, let's say. Sorcerer is OP as fuck, it's fun to play, it's a bit weak in the first few levels, but man, he scales like crazy later on. Remember, this is a very hard game in the first 10 hours or so, so I wouldn't recommend Sorcerer for beginners. Last in line, is a cleric. Why cleric when we have two clerics in the game with Harim and Tristian? 
Well, Harim is necro support, tanky cleric, bad basic stats, squishy and slow, and Tristian. Tristian is a mage version of a cleric, or better to say, a fire necro cleric oriented on damage spells. So, when you make a cleric, you can avoid having Tristian and Harim in your party, because you'll be a main tank, a main support with tons of buffs, and a healer, which means that you can take best companions with you. My favorite companions to have in a party are Knock Knock, Amiri, Jaital, Ekundayo, and of course Jubilus. Now, why are they my favorite companions? They just cover every buff, skill check, and damage you'll need in a game. All that you need from your party members is covered by those five. Good option to replace someone are those two Devil Sisters, because they count as one in like 90% of game time until they split. And, of course, Valerie, if you need a tank. All of this applies if you decide to go as a cleric, of course. If you go with something else, just have Harim or Tristian in your party. Now, speaking about Valerie. She's a tank, but she can also get one-shotted on harder difficulties, which means she's useless. Main tip that I have to give about this game is what I'll say next. So this is the most important thing in the entire guide. The next sentence. Now pay attention. This game, it values only one thing. It's how fast you're able to burst your enemies. Forget about tactics. Just buff everyone with 50 different buffs. Open with some cheesy AoE damage spell and burst. This is the only way to play on unfair. Forget about tanking and strategizing. Offense is the king in this game. Again, what works for unfair will work for all other difficulties also. Now, let's talk about what this game throws at you so you can decide what class and race to pick. Starting from weapons, because they are most important in the game. Pathfinder loves to give you two-handed melee weapons, and you only have a MIDI that can carry all of those beautiful weapons, unfortunately. So you might want to decide to go with a two-handed melee character as a main. Pathfinder loves to give you tons of bows and crossbows, and you only have a Kundayo and Octavia that can wield those bows and crossbows. Pathfinder loves to give you tons of monk amulets, Bracers, monk rings, monk armors. And you don't have a monk as a companion now, do you? It's funny, eh? So my advice is go and play with a monk as a main character. Pathfinder loves to give you a lot of heavy armors in the game. And only Valerie and Harim can carry those. And Valerie is a very boring right-click companion to have, while Harim gets one shot in a heavy armor on higher difficulties. Plus, you'll use him for healing and buffs, not for tanking. Pathfinder loves to give you a lot of short swords, long swords, rapiers, and sabers, and only useless Magus Regongar can carry those weapons. Pathfinder loves to give you a lot of scrolls, spells, wands and staffs and there is no wizard or a sorcerer companion in the game at all pathfinder loves to give you tons of exotic weapons but there is no single companion that can carry exotic weapons they don't have exotic weapons proficiency unless you spend a precious point in exotic weapons proficiency, so you might want to consider playing your main character with exotic weapons proficiency. So what to do then? One way to avoid frustration is to play as a monk. Another way to avoid frustration is to play as a two-handed melee weapons fighter or a paladin. Another way is to play as a dual-wielding tug rogue or ranger with one-handed swords and rapiers. 
That's how you minimize frustration. But fuck it, you lose sorcerer spells, wizards damage, or druids transmutation spells. It's a pain to pick a main class from the start. I gave you options what to play. Now it's your choice what you pick. Whatever you pick, you'll miss something. So multiple playthroughs are required if you want to see everything there is. Your companions are not enough. Now I'll give you 11 tips and tricks about the game mechanics, or better to say, 11 advices. Advice number one, save yourself some nerves and time in complete tutorial area on challenging difficulties. After you finish with all X trading post or Tartuccio fight, where you acquire Harim or Jaital, depends on your alignment, switch to hard or unfair. This game is uber stupid and unbalanced on hard and unfair till you reach like level 3 or so, it's doable, but it took me 10 hours to beat it on unfair and reach level 3. Just go with challenging and switch post level 3. Advice number 2. Harder difficulties force you to play with specific builds and classes from the beginning like deflect arrows feet, having animal companion or remaining light non-stop with party encumbrance. Play what you like to play. Pick a class you like the most, start on easier difficulties, then switch post level 3. Fuck them for balancing this game like garbage in a tutorial area, or suffer like I did with my monk and cleric playthroughs. Advice number 3. Stay away from races like goblins, asimars, tieflings for your first playthrough. This game is complicated enough, so do not complicate things more than that. Just pick classic stuff, pick a human, elf, dwarf, orc. You got plenty of choices, and all of them are valid. Advice number four, main class to pick. Just go with wizard, or go with a sorcerer, paladin, monk paladin mix. Monk Rogue mix. Monk Paladin is if you want to hit hard and be tanky. Monk Rogue is if you want to burst. Rogue because it's crazy OP. Rogue Slayer mix. Druid if you like to turn into different beasts like bears, dragons and so on. That way you won't miss gear. Advice number five. Try to be light non-stop. Party encumbrance. Go below the first dot here. Advice number six, pay attention from the very start and buy those inventory bags, holding bags or bag of holding. Those are your number one priority so you can carry more stuff. This thing over here can be found in Gudrin River in Linorm's cave. If you have snake high enough, you can acquire it very early on. So my advice, go and get it. Advice number seven, Build those villages, visit them, find artisans in a village, do their quest as fast as you can, you'll receive some really cool rewards and very unique items every month when you visit your throne room. Advice number 8. Do not pay attention on dices. Think of it as a poker machine. Just reload and start the fight again, and again, and again. You'll get good roll eventually, even on hardest difficulty. Advice number 9. Do your companion quests immediately when they're available. They'll receive huge buffs, you'll receive tons of XP, and they won't die on you in the last 20 hours of the game. Advice number 10. No matter what you do, how you play, have a Miri in your party. She's a freaking crazy and your main damage output. This applies for all team builds except when you go solo. Advice number 11. Research your enemies, inspect them. You'll know what resistances to apply and what targets to prioritize. Just click on it, hover over an enemy, and you'll see everything you need to see. Having all that in mind, we will go to the simple game mechanics, positioning, and how you should approach fights. Once you open, enter the maps, enter new maps, there will be encounters on those maps. So. You buff everyone up with spells that last 10 minutes per level from the start. Then you'll apply one minute per level 
after 10 minutes per level buffs. And then, just before you enter the fight, you'll apply one round per level buffs on your units. Always try to pause while applying buffs, because then those buffs will last longer. Never use buffs once the fight starts. You'll lose. This is the moment when you use damage spells. This is the time when you rush, burst, and kill. Care how you move your units because of the attacks of opportunity. Sometimes it's better to switch AI on for your sake. Pause the combat non-stop on every second or two. Always put characters like a Kundayo, a Jubilast, or Wizards, Sorcerers behind. Put Bursters on wings, supports in the middle, and tanks up front along with animal companions if you have it in your party. Communal buffs are always better than single target buffs. It's simple. Your entire party profits out of it. 2d6 is always stronger than 1d8. 3d6 is always stronger than 1d8 or 2d6. 15 or 16 to 20 crit multiplier is always far better than only 20. These are the rules without the boring mathematics and how it actually works. This is enough for you to know what items to use. Everything else, all other mathematics, they're bullshit and you can call them luck. Pure RNG, so don't bother with calculating bullshit. Just stick with simple numbers and avoid headaches. These here are numbers of attack per round. A round lasts for around 6 seconds. It's how many times you'll hit the enemy. Raising fortitude, reflex, and will, it's bloody important. These are your defenses against annoying enemies. The higher those are, the easier the game gets. Your tanky characters should always have fortitude, reflex, and will high, as high as possible. Squishy characters like Ekun, for example, they don't need it at all. They only need one thing, it's damage, and how fast they can deal that damage. Team fits are OP. Team fits are a must for harder difficulties, and that is a bloody fact. Good team fits are attack team fits, offensive team fits. They're far better than defensive team fits. Again, attack beats defense in this game. It beats it by far. You'll get your defense with buffs. Cleric is a must in your party. He provides healing, resurrections, and most importantly, he provides a lot of buffs, as you can see here. Do not think about playing this game without a cleric in your team. That's why the game gives you two companions as a cleric. Try to push as much as you can without resting. You save time like that. Time is precious in Pathfinder Kingmaker. Even if everyone is on low HP and you're without healing, risk three or four times in a row. Try to fight even on low HP. You'll be surprised how many times I won fights on unfair difficulty without buffs, without spells to cast, or without healing on low HP. You just need some lady luck, nothing else. He who dares wins, remember that. Recommended feats when you level up are not good at all. Care when you level up. Best feats are never recommended in 90% of cases. Have high perception on Jaytal, Amiri, Jubilast, Knock Knock, and Ekudayo. Remember that you roll dice for perception checks when you're exploring. So it's good to have at least two companions in your party with high perception if you want to spot hidden loot, traps, or doors. The amount of hidden stuff, hidden loot, and secrets in Pathfinder Kingmaker is huge, so consider revisiting some bigger maps on later levels for extra loot when your perception is high enough. Also, always have at least one character in your team that will be able to disarm traps or unlock doors or chests. Invest into trickery. You got Knock Knock and Jubilast for it. Pathfinder is plagued with annoying traps on every corner. Disarming or unlocking gives you XP to precious XP. When you fail to disarm a trap or a chest, 
reload and try again and again and again until it works. Sometimes it will take 10 reloads, sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll get it on the first attempt. Your main character should always have conversation maxed out, or better to say persuasion. After all, you'll speak a lot in the game and most XP in the game you'll gain by winning in those conversations. Way too many summons will cause frame drops and memory lags. Only way to fix that is to restart the game on every hour. Way too many flashy spells will also cause frame drops and memory leaks. Most frame drops and memory leaks you can expect from Wizard, Sorcerer and Magus, because they got a lot of flashy spells. Save often, make a manual save on every hour and have at least 5 quick save slots available. Remove auto saves if you want your game to work faster. Sell items in villages to reduce memory leaks and lags in the main kingdom. Merchants remember all the items you sold them, hence every time you enter the capital it will work worse and worse, slower and slower, with longer loading times. Now, if you have problems with resolving puzzles, finishing quests or killing some bosses, just type it on my channel, I got every secret puzzle and encounter in the game covered in two separate videos for every version of the game. One version is from 2018 for Pathfinder Kingmaker when the game was released and one is from late 2019 for Pathfinder Kingmaker Enhanced Edition. Now we're gonna switch to attributes and stats. Your primary stats first. Items do not stack. If you have, for example, plus four on strength on your belt and plus four on your armor, it will remain a plus four bonus to strength. It won't be plus eight. When one is plus six and the other one is plus four, it counts as plus six only. The highest stat counts and it's like this in 95% of items. Have that in mind when you play the game. Have your character boosted with every stat available as much as you can because every stat will provide something. Fortitude, Reflex, Will, Touch, Flat-Footed, Armor Class, Damage. Just have everything on. Strength is overall damage of melee characters. It also raises the number of how much you can carry and it raises athletic skill check. Dexterity raises your overall armor class in 90% of classes in a game. It also raises your range damage Mobility, trickery, and stealth checks goes up when you raise dexterity. Constitution. It raises your fortitude defense and your health. Intelligence. Raises your knowledge and lower skill checks. It determines how much skill points you'll get on every level to invest into your skills when you level up. Important for wizards and alchemists because it will raise their spell count. Wisdom raises will saving throws, perception, and lore checks. Clerics, druids, inquisitors, and rangers will get bonus spells to learn if you invest into wisdom. Charisma raises monk overall armor class, raises bard, paladins, and sorcerers number of spells what they can learn and equip. Its most important stat for conversations that are plenty in Pathfinder Kingmaker and it raises use magic device. The left bottom part is the most important here. Attack. How many times you attack per round in 6 seconds. Overall damage of your attacks and of course crit. The higher this number is, the more you'll hurt. The lower this number is, the bigger the chance you'll score a crit. Armor class is extremely important on all melee classes, along with fortitude, reflex, and will. Raise them as high as you can. Playing with range classes or wizards, sorcerers, you don't even need to look at fortitude, reflex, and will. Any saving throws at all, basically. They're not important. Skills in order. For your main character, you should always have persuasion, on maximum, always invest into it. Then it's class dependent. If you go with rogue, you'll go with trickery. 
If you go with Barbarian or Monk, you'll go with High Athletics and Mobility. Wizard or a Sorcerer, you'll go with Knowledge. Uh, Rangers, you're going to Lore Nature. Clerics, going to Lore Religion. At least two characters in your party should always have Perception maxed out with Investing per level. And of course, raising the overall stat with items that give Perception. Same applies for Trickery. At least two characters with maxed out Trickery is a must. Use magic device, it's okay to have on one character, so you can cook meals when you rest and get those rest bonuses that are very precious. And of course, you'll be able to cast different spells from scrolls and so on. Now, we switch to feats and how you should pick your feats smart and level up smart. Feats. Team feats are OP, but only offensive team feats and those would be Outflank, Precise Strike, and from Defensia, Shake It Off is great. Make sure that all of your melee characters have their stream team fits and the game becomes very easy. Rest of the fits that are just great in 90% of classes are Hammer the Gap, Dazzling Display, Critical Focus, Improved Initiative is always great, Dodge, blind fight, toughness. I'll now hover over every companion for you so you can pause and check out what feats you should use for every class that exists in the game. Remember, if it works on unfair, it will work on all difficulties. So here we go.
Now we talk about how you're going to end up dead if you don't apply buffs and communal resistances. Most important part of Pathfinder is preparation for maps and battles. The only way to do this is by applying buffs. Clerics are kings of buffs, and you cannot play this game without a cleric on harder difficulties. Inquisitors, rangers, bards, and alchemists are great buffers too, but clerics are the kings of this. I don't want to drag way too much here. These are the most important buffs in the game that you should apply every time the game becomes easy. Communal AoE buffs are great and you should cast them first because they last longer. Apply single target buffs after them, then 10 seconds before you enter the battle. Apply round per level buffs, then rush. So let's go with full list of buffs you should always have. Now we talk about RNG. RNG is a huge factor. Better to say, will you hit enemies or not? Or vice versa, will you dodge hits and crits or not? My only advice is, reload every time when the fight goes wrong. Trust me, sometimes it takes 50 attempts on unfair to get good rolls and crit someone, especially in the beginning of the game. Just be patient. Now we talk about how to level up and how it will fuck up your builds entirely. Very short here. Just don't do it. It's crap. It sucks. It will make your life miserable. Turn this auto level up off immediately from the settings. That's all I have to say about it. Now we're going to switch to items and how those items work. I'll hover over some items here, what you should aim for and what you should use. You can also pause the game and check where the items are acquired, were acquired. So let's start.
Now we talk about kingdom management and what are the most important things to do in your kingdom. We start from this stable unrest. When it goes low, you level up stability and it will go higher. Treasurer BP, build points. This is your most important upgrade in the kingdom and you should max it out as soon as possible. As fast as you can. So you max it out by raising economy and investing, building those buildings in villages, cities, towns that provide you with economy. Problems are always bigger than opportunities. They're more important to resolve than opportunities. Always solve problems first. Artisans, unlock them as fast as possible. When you claim new region, you pick a village, you build it, go on foot to that village, you exit your capital, go on foot, visit it, find the artisan of the village, and complete artisan quests as fast as possible. You'll get great rewards, XP, and great gear when you visit your throne room. How to unlock more advisors? Raising divine on level four, for example, will unlock arcane, so you'll get new advisor spot. Raising loyalty will unlock culture. Raising relations will unlock espionage. Raising military will unlock stability. Do not forget to do the ancient curse quest the moment it pops. It's usually good to do it like 10 to 20 days left from expiring. Be prepared with tons of buffs and summon for Ancient Curse fights. Maybe even rest with some cooking bonuses just before you enter the map. Claiming territories is your top priority. Build villages and houses, pair them up well, go for those plus stats buildings that give you all around resists in your region. Raise economy, build aviary, so you can resolve issues outside of your borders. Bulletin board and TPs or mages towers, so you can fast travel around the map. Do not forget to upgrade villages to towns and towns to cities when you're able to. Do not forget to upgrade buildings in towns and later on in the cities. Main map now. Few tips and tricks and what you should go for from start to finish with mini minor spoilers here. After tutorial area, you'll start from Oleg's trading post. Your main objective is to level up on all of the mini maps around and reach Old Sycamore. Complete everything there is before you go and fight with the Stag Lord, your main objective. You got plenty of time to do it. Once you establish your kingdom, go for South Nara Marches and Camel Lands and finish everything there. After you're done with Act 2, Act 3 will begin, and this will be the perfect time to do everything around Lake Silverstep. After that, until Act 4 starts, I recommend clearing North Narl Marshes and Dire Narl Marshes, these two areas here. By the time you finish with those narrow marshes, one hold will get opened. And as soon as you get a letter from Megar Varn, do not waste time. Go immediately to Varnhold if you want to have good outcome of the main quest. Now Varnhold, you want to do it in this order, as it is here. You start with Varnhold region, you transfer to Dunsward, then you go to Silverstep, and then you proceed to Tours of Levenis. Speaking about Tours of Levenis, I'm warning you from the start. Have clerics, have damage to undead, have holy bombs on your alchemist, have tons of consumables, a lot of buffs, and at least 50 rations for this entire area here, because you're gonna rest a lot. The right time to play Van Hold DLC is between Act 2 and Act 3, so once you're done with Troll Trouble. 
then you start with one whole slot DLC. Do not waste time and go straight for it. I'm warning you up front, one whole DLC is very, very hard. After you're done with one hold, famous Armag quest will start. Do not waste time, go straight for it. Amiri depends on you here. Your next area will be Glenebon. Have high perception on at least two characters in order to find Armag's tomb. After you're done with all of that, Pitax will start. I like to call Pitax as four easy levels. Tons of XP in conversations in Pitax area. Make sure you succeed in every conversation there is in Pitax. Reload when you fail in conversations. Just succeed, you level up fast. Once you're done with Pitax, the final part opens. Thousand Voices. Complete everything there is in Thousand Voices. Go back to your capital one last time. Upgrade everything there is and finish the final Ancient Curse quest. After you're done with the Ancient Curse, go to the House of Infinite Loading Screens and enter the final area. Castle of Knives is your final destination. Everything that happens after Castle of Knives is linear and map becomes unimportant. I tried to give you the correct order of what to do without spoiling the game for you. You can always pause and check all of those dots on the minimap in case you miss something. I'll scroll it once more for you. Discover the secret bus in Lonely Barrow, post level, let's say, 16, 17. Do not forget to kill the big badass dragon on this spot. 